So welcome to the OHSU Informatics Conference. We again have our second of three summer intern uh, presentation sessions. So this is a little longer than usual because we have three interns present. They have 15 minutes each uh, with five minutes per question roughly. Uh, as you know, our intern program is sponsored by the National, Lib National Library of Medicine. So we're very grateful to their support over these past five years. Um, and we've had a lot of wonderful interns come in and we'll have um, some great interns today as well. I'm Dave Dore, uh, Vice Chair and uh, Associate Professor of the Department. And um, do we have anybody actually monitoring the, uh, the website? Uh, so maybe we can get doing that. Usually um, we have somebody monitoring. You can send a text, um, hashtag bmicehump, C-O-N-F or sort of at OHSU Informatics is the, is the user. Um, so if you ask your questions, we'll try and answer them. Great, so I'm gonna turn it over to the, actually the first mentor who's gonna introduce her mentee, Terry. Hi, I'd like to introduce Terry Cross. Terry's been interning with Vishnu and myself. She's had two projects, so she's gotten to juggle two projects this summer. Um, she's going to be telling you about an evidence-based decision aid that we have created for mammography for women in their 40s. And she's going to also be speaking with you about curriculum to core competencies. Hi. So when I started the summer, I had really expected to just work with Dr. Eden. But due to the unexpected nature of things, and I was going to plan, I was able to also assist Dr. Mohan as well. So I present to you today my tale of two projects. And as Dr. Eden already told you, so it's the evidence-based decision aid from research to public use, and also matching clinical informatics curriculum to core competencies. I'd like to start. Project the first. So my work with Dr. Eden this summer involved updating and revising a decision aid. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on what decision aids are because most of you are probably familiar with those. But briefly, the MammoPad is a breast cancer screening decision aid that was designed for average risk women in their 40s. And it was sort of divided into three separate uh, components. The first component is the risk assessment. And this is where the users start out to determine whether or not they're of average risk. Um, they ask, answer a series of questions, and uh, this is based on um, a risk screening that was developed by Dr. Cecilia Belkoff back in uh, uh, 2009, I believe. Um, so if they are above average risk, what happens is they get exited out of the app and are advised to seek further information from their uh, healthcare provider. The second component is the information play piece. And this gives the users information about the risks of, of breast cancer. And it also gives them some uh, kind of an insight into what to expect when they first go in for their first mammogram. The final piece is the values assessment. And this is where they can kind of determine what their own personal values are in regards to the, like, the benefits or the harms of mammograms. And it kind of brings in that whole um, personal issue. The final takeaway is a report that they are presented with. It's in the form of a PDF and the users can take this information with them um, when they go to visit their provider and it prepares them to have that discussion on what options work best for them regarding uh, when to start their mammogram screening. Uh, this, this app basically addresses the controversy that experts are not in agreement on when average risk women in their 40s should start their screening. Um, the doctors and clinicians, uh, they're basically faced with a lot of conflicting recommendations, and it makes it difficult for them to know what advice to give their patients. This tool addresses that by first, as, as you saw, giving the, uh, the risk assessment to women, and then guiding them to a decision that they can make that's right for them. Uh, now back in the beginning of summer, Dr. Eden and I did meet with representatives for the Center for Women's Health to discuss the steps in implementing this tool into the clinic. One of the first suggestions that they wanted was to see branding. 
In other words, to see the OHSC logo put onto several of the pages in the app, as well as on the final report PDF. Um, I also needed to go through and remove any remaining research text that was left over from the research stage. Um, there were a couple comments about seeing the research coordinator, so I had to make sure those were taken out. Um, and I also wanted to include a hotline. So some women who might be either uninsured or underinsured uh, for them to call. And the resource that I found was for the Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. This is a public health program that women can call to find out if they're eligible. And if so, it gives them um, information on local providers that offer free screens. Um, so we also wanted to include a disclosure page. Um, the disclosure page tells basically who the developers were and if there was any conflict of interest. Uh, it explains kind of the, the process that was gone through with the development of the app. Um, and it also talks about when, we had to include this, when the update schedule is. Um, it also explains the intended users of the app. And so this is going to be put into the app. It's not in there right now, but we're at that point of just going ahead and getting it put in. The final piece is trying to get it um, to, to get it verified by the International Patient Decision Aid Standards. So there was a checklist that was uh, put out by IFDOS, and I took this checklist and kind of matched it up to what the app does now. And one of the interesting things that we found right off is that there was 11 of the criteria that really didn't apply to what the mammal pad does. One of the examples is using patient stories. So when we took out those 11 non-applicable criteria, and with the changes that we're making right now, we feel like we're going to be able to meet 100% of the applicable criteria and hopefully get this um, approved. So looking forward to this app, we have heard from Providence, and they seem to be interested. Uh, there's going to be, I think, a meeting set up soon to get a demo, and <coughs> hopefully they'll move forward on that. And um, we're still kind of waiting to hear back from the Center for Women's Health. And it also is possible for it to be used in some of the orphan clinics, which is, uh, I believe, where some of the research started out. Okay, at this time, I'd like to move on to my second summer project, project second. Now, when I first enrolled in the informatics program at Portland Community College, um, I wasn't real sure what to expect there, but based on the curriculum, it seemed to me that the de definition of informatics was basically just electronic health records. And it wasn't really until I started here that I kind of saw that there's this big, broader view of what is biomedical informatics. So what are the competencies? Um, American Medical Informatics Association, AMIA, has defined the informatics. I don't want to read the whole thing to you. But you can see by their definition that this is a really broad scope. Um, it covers a lot of different subspecialties. But all of those subspecialties all share certain basic fundamental skills, and those skills have been developed into core competencies. Those can be used to build a, a focused and um, more standardized curriculum for colleges. And the Commission for Accreditation for Health Informatics and Information is where that started out. And I think that now they're working with AMIA to further refine these criteria. Uh, in 2009, um, Dr. Reed Gardner took some of these competencies and further refined them. He broke them into four different categories. The first is the fundamentals, which is kind of all the basic information about uh, informatics itself. Uh, the second, the kind of clinical decision-making care process. So this is all the, the evidence-based care and uh, clinical decision-making thing. Uh, the informatics, the health information systems, that's basically all the technical stuff. Um, and then finally, the leadership and management. So things like the implementation, leading the change to implementation and um, maintenance. At OHSU, as you know, probably, they, they offer uh, a few different degree programs. There's the Master of Science, there's the Master of Biomedical Informatics, and Graduate Certificate. And over time, these, um, these different programs need to evolve in order to stay current with all of the changes in technologies and as we discover the new uses for biomedical data. So it 
kind of presents this problem where we need to go back periodically and review the curriculum to ensure that we're still meeting those four criteria, those four uh, competencies. I started out with this by becoming uh, an observer status in some of these classes. And that gave me access to all of the, uh, all of the course content. Um, so I had to be enrolled in previous classes, nothing current. Uh, at that point, what I would do is just systematically go through all the course materials week by week. So it was like reading, uh, the, reading the lecture notes, actually sometimes watching some of the lectures, the online presentation, and all the articles and some of the reading. I was actually able to find a few of the books that were required that were available online. Um, I used a checklist uh, that was developed three years ago as a spreadsheet, and all I was doing was making sure that in the content that it was uh, confirming if it was met in the courses, or maybe if it was not there, I just didn't see it. Um, I also found that there were a few places that were um, not previously covered that looked like it was being included. Uh, this, when I first got explained this, it seemed like a pretty straightforward. Um, I really found that it took much longer than I anticipated. Um, there's a lot of content. And it's also really difficult to decide if the competencies are being met or not, because sometimes in one of the lectures or readings, I would see a keyword. But when I actually dig through it and read through it, it's not really covering. It's not really explaining or defining it very well. So it's kind of hard to decide that. Um, the next step would be to contact some of the instructors and kind of confirm with them if they feel that this is being covered in their courses or not. This, uh, this process was time consuming and yes, juggling two projects sometimes was busy. So my summer started out kind of slow and quickly I found myself very busy. So I thought this was a great picture um, mm -hmm. because it made me think of what my family probably saw me over the last few weeks. Um, so I just want to say I really appreciate the, uh, the chance to work with Dr. Eaton. Um, it's really exciting to see how her decision aids moving forward. And I also really want to appreciate or, or say thank you to Dr. Mohan for giving me a chance to see the programs that OHSU offers and to see all of the various aspects that are, you know, the expanding areas of bioinformatics. I'd also like to give thanks to uh, Lindsay Watson for giving me some advice this summer and giving me some support. Also, the people at OHSU Sakai, this is the online pro program, and I'm telling you, these people were great. When I read needed anything, they, they were right on it, so I really appreciate that. I'd also like to thank all of the people at DMICE for giving me this chance this summer, and of course, my fellow interns. I think they're an exciting group, and I'm sure that they're going to want to do great things. So, that's it. Thank you very much. I have one. Okay. What was the, the coverage that we had in the in our classes for those core set of classes against the competencies? Was it pretty good? It think? was pretty good. There was there was a few, and again, the the beginning courses were a lot more. They covered a lot more because they were all like <coughs> basic knowledge and stuff. So um, Dr. Hirsch's class, of course, covered quite a bit. Um, and he was great because I was able to send him the email and kind of point out the things I couldn't find. And he would either say, yes, I am, or no, I don't cover that. So it was really great. Um, it's, it's challenging to have to email an instructor and say, you know, I don't think you're covering this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I think you have to, I think as an instructor, I would expect that you would, you'd have that, you know, hey, this is important, you know. If I'm not, then I'm not. I need to, you need to reflect that. And then, you know, because curriculum does change, books change. Yeah. So I, I also, I, just a comment um, is that for the first part of your presentation, we had a webinar this morning on, uh, for the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, and so that's 60, you know, 66 clinics in Oregon. They, they are required to implement decision aids, and of the six milestones we mentioned, decision aids being one, decision aids was by far the mm -hmm. hardest one for them to implement, the one they anticipate having ongoing uh, difficulties with. So I, you know, can't understate that both what you found that Center for Women's Health uh, sort of asked for these changes and then are like, well, we don't quite, we're not ready, quite ready to put it in. And, um, and that, you know, this aspect, it, it's important to, I think, a lot of patients, but clinics are really struggling to put it in. 
Well, and I would suppose, so Dr. Ian did share with me the fact that just something simple like putting an OHC logo, um, she said that was a very complicated process behind the scenes that she was dealing with as far as filling out a lot of paperwork and licensing, only to come to find out that, oh, you just want the logo? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all of these little things you have to walk through. That, you know, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm really glad to see it, and hopefully uh, Providence will take it off. Any other questions? So I'm, I'm Michael Chang, and I have the pleasure of introducing Emily over here. Um, now, for those of you who don't know Emily, she's going to be a senior at the University of Washington um, in the fall, and she's studying public health. And she's been a real pleasure to work with here. Emily is, um, so we work with a big group of um, collaborators from around the country in different areas, and Emily's been a really, really good team player, you know, worked well with everybody, and she's also done a good job of learning things independently. And um, yeah, you got, you got yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll Just talk some more. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> So um, the group that I work with um, deals, um, does a lot of work involving an eye disease called retinopathy of prematurity, uh, ROP. And specifically, we work on technologies like telemedicine and computer-based image okay. analysis. And uh, Emily had some projects that dealt with various aspects uh, of that that she'll be talking about uh, once we get this up. Thank you so much. 
Zone is the first thing to measure how far out the blood vessels are growing from the eye. If you see in this top image here, uh, zone one, zone two, and zone three. The further out the blood vessels, the better. This image here is uh, of a healthy eye of an infant, and you can see that the blood vessels are going fully outward towards the end of the eye. The second category to look at is stage, on a scale from one to five. Here, when, what happens when the blood vessels don't grow out fully is that this white demarcation line grows perpendicular to the blood vessels. It might be hard to make out the first image, but imagine how doctors feel as well. So you can see here that there's a white line appearing in stage one, a white line here in stage two, uh, greater severity, this ridge, stage three, and then stage four. When reach, if an infant reaches stage three, that's when treatment will become required, and unfortunately, to, or to avoid unfortunate cases like this, where the retina is almost is completely detached from the eye, and leads, that infant will then become blind. The third and possibly most important part for a diagnosing ROP is something called plus disease, which looks at the overall tortuosity or squiggliness of the blood vessels. You can see in this image here, the blood vessels are very curvy and dilated, which would indicate that this infant here has plus disease. However, that can be difficult to diagnose among clinicians. So if you look in these black images here, this is where telemedicine and computer-based image analysis comes in handy and is very important in helping diagnose ROP. Here, specific line segments from the blood vessels of a certain case was taken, and then you can look at the measure of the length and then the angle of the blood vessel, and then put a quantitative score on something that is otherwise qualitative. So, for example, if you have high blood pressure, if you're above a certain number, you have high blood pressure. Hopefully, with advancements in uh, computer-based image analysis, we'll be able to put an uh, objective quantitative score on something that can otherwise be qualitative and subjective, which is illustrated in this image here. If you look, between the 21 experts who diagnosed this eye, half, nearly half said plus, and then half said not plus. That makes it very difficult to know if the infant needs to be treated for ROP or not which is sort of where my role came in this summer, focusing on a specific data set. In this data set, I was given um, the diagnosis of 887 subjects, and looking at the comparison of two experts who looked at all these images for all the different categories for each eye, and then comparing that to the clinical diagnosis. When looking at this data set, uh, we measured one thing called the Kappa statistic, which basically takes uh, agreement and accounts for the chance, it accounts for chance. So in, here are some of the results from what we found when using, um, when trying to look for the Kappa statistic. If you can see, I changed the data set so it was binary, so either it was above stage three or not, zone one or not, plus or not, and then treatment requiring or not. When you look at the agreement percentages, they're all quite high, most of them above 90%, which would indicate very strong agreement. But then when you look at the Kappa statistics, they're not quite as high, demonstrating that uh, experts' bias and variability can really kind of show that um, diagnosing ROP is much more difficult because our percentages are as high between different experts. If you look at expert one versus expert two, they're much higher in agreement between the expert one in clinical and then expert two in clinical. This is what demonstrates how telemedicine is very important, showing that expert greater agreement is important in understanding how, when just looking at images, ROP can be diagnosed versus the time that you're at the bedside looking at ROP in an infant. And then, so, um, this is kind of where my second role came in this summer of trying to take all this information and then how can we relay that to the public? And my second job here was taking this information, say, from this data set and then building a website, um, which will be known as irop.com, which will be a great repository of images and different data sets to show experts, researchers, and clinicians how to better learn about diagnosing ROP and what ROP is. This is also very important because here at OHSU, we're very lucky to have um, highly trained, specialized ROP ophthalmologists. That's not the case in other hospitals in rural areas or other countries. And by having a website like this, by having a website in general that can be accessed internationally, the goal is that people across the world are, can learn more about ROP and how to make more quantitative, correct diagnoses amongst different experts. So I made the website using um, a couple tools. First, Bootstrap, which is a great front-end framework source that can be great for using mobile devices. And then Brackets, the text editor visible here. The first is some HTML, some CSS, in addition to some JavaScript. So you go from something like this to then something like this. Here will be what the preliminary uh, idea of what the home page will look like. That way, clinicians, researchers, and other people can access database sets. 
to compare images and see where the discrepancies are occurring. For example, when you go to one of the pages, you'll have something like this, showing that expert one and expert two agreed and disagreed in almost all of these areas by looking at this eye. This is incredibly important in trying to learn about and understand where the discrepancy is occurring and what information can we take away from that. That way, more correct diagnoses can be made for infants with ROP and if treatment will be required. Um, now you all may be wondering, why does this matter? Back when Stevie Wonder was born in 1950, not many premature infants survived. But with the advancement of medicine, now more premature infants are surviving. And with that, there's increased incidence rate of ROP to begin with. This has uh, many economic impacts and different impacts about just overall understanding how to correctly diagnose ROP and finding ways to increase the overall greater agreement between experts. As I mentioned before, this is incredibly important when you're looking at places in emerging countries or places, rural areas, where you don't have any ROP specialists to make diagnoses. By using something like the RETCAM, images can then be taken from, say, the nurse, and then can be sent to specialists through the web, and then diagnoses can be made to decide if that infant needs treatment or not, which is, a, again, a great way to have that website open and to have a good model for how ROP should be diagnosed and how, where the screens are occurring. And then this also focuses on the accuracy of diagnosis. When looking at, again, the percent agreement, it's high between experts, but you don't always have an expert making that diagnosis. So that's why it's important to have uh, something like this website and then use information from that data set to look where should research go further into better diagnosing ROP. Uh, overall, I'll just may talk about my experiences here at OHSU. Probably one of my favorite parts was being able to go with Dr. Chang into the NICU and observe just how everything was being used, how he was making his diagnosis using the ophthalmoscope, and then watching how the RETCAM worked to take these images, and actually seeing the progress of the infants over the following weeks, and seeing if their ROP had hopefully regressed, or unfortunately, the times where it did progress. My time here, I was able to learn a lot of new programs, including R, to make the statistical analysis, bootstrap, and then using, um, yeah, using R in bootstrap. And then, you know, coming before I came here, uh, actually I started out originally going to pre-law, and now this has changed, as you can tell, I'm more interested in informatics. And I think that this internship has done a great job showing what to do with a huge amount of information, and where does your role come in working as an informaticist in a hospital. I came here kind of with the idea, naive idea, that it was mostly just run by doctors, which is obviously not the case. And seeing how people of all different specialties and areas of expertise can work together to make, you know, make for a common goal or cause like ROP. And with that, I'd just like to give a special thanks uh, to working with Dr. Chang, had a great summer, and with our study coordinator, Susan Osmo, and the rest of the ROP team, Jay Shuri, Peter, Paul, and Michael. And then a special thanks to my fellow interns, Jesse, for being a great office buddy, and Ben for really helping teach me how to use R to begin with, and just all the fellow DMICE interns and everyone involved this summer. So, thanks. The website hopefully soon is in the next month, so I'm just waiting a couple of them, so yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs>
Ben's getting his slide up. I am actually the mentor for uh, Ben Neely. We're very uh, glad to have him this summer. He's actually our second intern. Steve went last week and gave a great presentation. Um, ben has uh, actually earned his uh, undergraduate degree uh, already, um, and so is actually actively looking for work after this internship. Do you know anything? Uh, he's been fantastic to work with. He's very quantitative and, and skilled uh, already, so he'll talk about how he used those skills in a couple different projects. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily, and thank you, uh, Terry, for your excellent presentations, and thank you all for taking the time to be here. Today, I'm going to be talking about Cases for data utilization and analysis, primarily with the top med and CPC studies. But I'd like to start out with a quote from one of my favorite statisticians, John Tukey, who was a pioneer of some of the modern methods that we use today. He said, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. This really rings true from my experience here at OHSU this summer. I came in with an experience in research being very academic and very task driven. But on my first day, I sat down and I met with Dr. Dorf, and he told me, if you feel lost and you have no idea what you're doing, you're probably on the right track. This opened my eyes to a different way of doing research, a more exploratory research method. And it also gave me the opportunity to play in some of these different backyards, the first of which being TopMed. TopMed stands for Transforming Outcomes for Patients Through Medical Home Evaluation and Redesign. It was a study using some of the principles, primarily high-value elements, from the Medical Home Program. This is an Oregon-based program, but it's similar to programs being developed throughout the United States. Now, a high-value element is a predetermined area where you can get the most bang for your buck, so to speak, how you can improve the functioning and the quality of clinical practices while reducing costs. These elements were predetermined before the beginning of the TopMed program and therefore implemented in TopMed. Uh, this was a program that was conducted throughout the past few years in eight Oregon-based clinics in a cluster randomized controlled trial design. Now what that means is that each clinic acted as a cluster, or each clinic received either an intervention or a control treatment, which I'll describe momentarily. The physicians, therefore, within each clinic practiced and tried to follow the standards based on the intervention or the control which they were assigned to. This is a general overview, thank you Dr. Dorf for this graphic, of the intervention and control methods or parts of the study. The intervention being incentives with a multiplier, focus practice support, rapid cycle IT improvement. Again, these were based on very specific high value elements. On the other hand, the control was based on elements that the clinics themselves determined to be important and then set relevant goals for. These included same incentives, though lacking a multiplier, general practice support, and the same IT components. I'll now go through and sort of break each of those things down. The incentives were obviously monetary because few things motivate people more than money. Um, with the control group, the money that they were allocated was based on how well they set and followed up on their goals. It was one lump sum based on those criteria. With the incentives and the multiplier in the intervention group, this was broken down a little bit further. Most of the money came for the same reason. However, there was a portion that was also attributed with a multiplier, um, determining how much of that portion they got, that was also based on continuing follow-up and on further developing their goals. This allowed those in the intervention group to earn a slightly larger incentive, thus promoting the idea of following these high-value element-based goals. The focus practice support, again, was a high contact between those conducting the top med study and each of the clinics involved in the intervention, seeing how they were doing with their goals, offering support, and offering ideas for that, how they could better reach them. The rapid cycle IT improvement was constant feedback and constant improvements to the IT systems that they were using. Now, we didn't want to deprive any clinics of any valuable information, so the IT between control and intervention groups was largely the same but those in the intervention group had access to tier rankings and to see where they stood as far as their success in the program thus far. Now, when I came into the project, um, most of the data had already been gathered and analyses had started. Unfortunately, we were getting some kind of anomalies, some discrepancies. 
we were looking at the data from a clinical level, trying to match up how many patients were in each clinic based on the all-payer, all-claims, or APAC data set, which is an Oregon-based data set that, again, contains all payers and all claims, versus the number of patients that we knew were attributed to each clinic and each provider based on electronic health records. I want to draw your attention to the last line here in this table. Those are the percents. These are calculated by looking at the number in the claims, the number of patients, and dividing that by the number that we know are associated with each provider in the electronic health records. And you'll notice there are a couple that are over 100%. This hinders our analysis and stands out as a red flag. This is something that we need to correct. Now, there are difficulties associated with this, namely that the all-payer, all-claims data set is de-identified. We don't know which patient saw which doctor specifically. We know which clinic they went to, but we can't identify these patients and match them up directly. And so it was my job to come in and match based on the provider, find out how many individuals or patients each provider was seeing, and then compare that to the all-payer, all-claims data set. In order to do this, I used a two-step matching process in R based on unique identifiers, the first of which being NPI, or National Provider Identification. This is a number that's assigned to each practitioner of medicine during the accreditation process. It's a unique identifier, but it's not perfect. There were occasions where this number was missing in the records, or it was entered incorrectly, or if it was just altogether wrong. Um, so when, we, when I matched based on the NPI, I got about 75% matching, which is better than nothing, but not sufficient to clear up these results. I then went and did a second level of matching based on EHR provider ID, which again is a unique identifier based on the electronic health records. Using that, I was able to match all but two of the providers, enabling us to continue on with our analyses. This is a subset of the table, which was fairly large, that shows some of the percentages, again calculated the same way as the clinic-based percentages, though on a provider level. And you can see some of these percentages are ridiculous. We got as high as 161,000% of patients being visited by any one physician, or visiting any one physician. There are a number of different reasons this could be occurring. The physician could be working in other clinics. Uh, patients could be misattributed to a physician, etc. However, this is still important to make note of. And so after discussing with Dr. Dorr, we made some exclusion criteria for which providers to include and which to exclude. After developing these criteria, we were able to reevaluate the data at a clinic level and reduce the percentages to something much more realistic, thus enabling us to continue with further analysis. We're now going to jump into another backyard with CPC, or Comprehensive Primary Care. This program is similar to TopMed in that it seeks to improve healthcare while reducing costs, but the methods are a little bit different. CPC focuses on delivering value-based care rather than volume-based care, so that uh, physicians are paid and incentivized based on the health of their patients rather than on the number of services that they perform. Um, this encourages preventive care and proactive care, and therefore the overall health of the patient population. Now, CPC was run over the past few years in several OHSU clinics and in other clinics, and so it was my opportunity to come in during one of the review periods after nine quarters of CPC. Um, I was tasked with developing a way to look at these, at the progress thus far of CPC, and see how we're doing, whether or not it's having a positive impact on these clinics, on quality measures, and on expenditures. Dave asked me to create SPC charts, or statistical process control charts, for this purpose. Now, I was unfamiliar with this, and this is kind of a unique use of SPC charts. Typically, they're used for manufacturing processes in which you look at product quality over time to determine whether or not there are large gaps in variance and in quality. Um, but this is also a great way for identifying any patterns or points that stick out and looking at how a trend develops over time. These are a few examples of some of the SPC charts I created. Um, I ended up creating around 15 of these, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on these three. The x-axis on each of these charts is broken up into the quarter. The first four values you'll notice are negative, and those indicate the run-in time or the four quarters prior to the beginning of CPC. 
The subsequent nine quarters are those quarters in which the clinics were practicing under the CPC guidelines. The y-axis represents a proportion of hospitalizations. This is defined as the number of hospitalizations per patient per quarter. The points represent the averages of those patient visits, of those proportions, for each of those quarters. You'll notice that some of the points are different colors. A black point is just a regular point. A yellow point represents a possible trend that may be of interest, and I'll explain that in a moment, whereas a red point represents something that's outside of the norm and potentially statistically significant. You'll notice there are two dashed lines, and those represent the upper and lower confidence levels. Anything within those confidence levels we consider normal. It's not different from that center line or that average which we would expect. With this first graph, this large one, you'll notice that there's a series of points that are all above that center line. That's why there are some points that turn yellow. They're saying, hey, we expect these to be bouncing back and forth around that confidence line as if there was random variance. This may indicate that our confidence or our center line needs to be a little bit higher, a little bit closer to that so that we're more accurately representing the trend. The points outside represent those, again, that are statistically significant. In this case, these are below the lower confidence level, indicating that they're significantly lower than our expected average. And this is good. We can see the overall trend is decreasing, suggesting that CPC had a positive impact in reducing the number of hospitalizations in clinics A through C. But we can break this up even further. Rather than just looking at an aggregate of three different clinics, we can look at individuals. I've only selected two of the three that were included, again, for the sake of time. You'll notice that with clinic A, all of those points are within our confidence levels. There's nothing unusual. These are all fairly close to the average which we were expecting. But if we look at clinic B, both before and after CPC, we see some extreme values. This suggests that clinic B might have a greater impact on the overall trends that we're seeing as far as hospitalizations are concerned. Now, the nice thing about being a statistician is we get to present data to people. We get to explain the world through numbers and through visualizations. But it's important that we have effective tools to do this. Another part of creating these SPC charts was to make them publicly available, to make sure that people had access to this information so that improving health care could be a shared goal for all. In doing this, I was asked to create a Shiny application. Shiny is an R script-based application builder that also uses some elements from HTML. It's a great way to deliver interactive, customizable data visualization experiences. I will now go through and do a demonstration of the Shiny app, which I built for this project. Internet loading times pending. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that this is just showing the same plots which you saw earlier. The difference being that now we can select exactly what we want to see, and we have access to more information. We can select specifically which clinics we are interested in, as well as the quality measures that we are interested in. Here we have hospitalizations, hospital readmissions, and emergency department visits. And again, this information is available for each of the clinics. Now, these have been de-identified so as not to promote or hinder the development of any other projects or cause any legal concerns. But these do represent the actual results from CPC, and so this is a valuable learning information tool. Now, CPC is ongoing. We are still gathering data from subsequent quarters, and it will be included in both the Shiny app and in future publications. This allows us to expand the Shiny app to further develop our communication tools and to include more quality measures, such as cost effectiveness. TopMed concluded, and we recently gathered more data from all payer, all claims. The results of that are forthcoming, and therefore you can expect to see how this succeeded and where that will go in the future shortly. Finally, I'd like to make some acknowledgments to the DMICE team, to David, Fabio, Doug, Jesse, Lindsay, Melanie, Raja, Shelby, Stephen, and Tracy. Special thanks to Stephen. He was my cubicle mate and helped keep me sane through some of the more difficult programming tasks. 
then to Katrina Ramsey on the biostatistics team for helping me with the analysis and formatting, and to my fellow informatics interns who provided me with great feedback and networking opportunities. Thank you, and we'll now open up for questions. As far as the general hypotheses for why those are the particular trends we're seeing, I'm actually meeting with some of the clinicians to talk about developing hypothesis tests for that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.